Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast. If you're part of our podcast family, welcome back. And for those of you keeping track, this is episode number 127. I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to my listeners and viewers of this podcast. Our listeners and viewers have downloaded episodes of this podcast more than 35,000 times. When we add downloads from our syndication partners, that number jumps to over 80,000 downloads. Speaking of syndication partners, a special thanks to two of our partners who syndicate this show. A special thanks to Mike Buto of Circuit Assembly Magazine, who syndicates this show on PCBchat.com, and to Fred Schenkelberg of Ascendo Reliability at Reliability.fm. Fred curates a number of reliability-based podcasts, including this one. In recent episodes, we've covered high-level issues, such as hiring best practices, novel training methods, design for manufacturing, highly accelerated life testing or HALT testing, and much more. On this episode, we're going back to the basics. What common problems are assemblers experiencing today? What are the basics of electronic assembly best practices? Which problems seem to live in perpetuity? To answer these and other questions, I've invited back two of my favorite experts onto the show. If you've been in the electronics assembly industry for pretty much any amount of time, there's little doubt you've heard of Phil Zaro and Jim Hall. Phil has been involved with PCB fabrication and assembly for more than 36 years. Phil is the president and principal consultant of ITM Consulting. Jim Hall has been involved in the electronics assembly industry for the past 27 years. He's a principal consultant and resident Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt with ITM Consulting. He's also an instructor in the Lean Six Sigma programs offered at Dartmouth College. Together with Dr. Ron Lasky, Phil and Jim designed the Surface Mount Technology Association's SMT Process Certification course. More information on that valuable course is available at smta.org. A couple of years ago, Phil and Jim published a book entitled Troubleshooting Electronic Assemblies, Tales from the Board Talk Crypt. I'll talk to them about this book later in the broadcast. Phil and Jim host the popular audio series Board Talk, a question and answer show hosted on the Circuit Insight website. On their show, you'll hear serious questions and often comical but real answers. A heartfelt welcome back to my friends Phil Zaro and Jim Hall. Hey, Mike. Hi, fellas. Hey, Mike. Good welcome back. back. Thank you. Good to be back. It's good to have you. Um, so the last time we spoke, uh, you guys were quite busy solving problems. Have all the problems been solved? Oh, absolutely. All done? Yeah. yeah all we done. need a few more. Somebody has a, we need a new technology or invention to kind of throw some loops. Yeah. Well, if that's true, this might be our last ever Reliability <laughs> Matters broadcast. Yeah. yeah. We believe that I something tells me that um, something tells me that by the time you guys win the lottery, buy an island in Tahiti, and and go retire there, there will still be plenty of problems. And uh, something tells me they're not going to go away. Yeah, big point, Mike. So before we dig into problems and solutions and and all of that, um, for those few who are uh, unaware of who you are and ITM consulting in general, um, share with my audience a little bit more information about um, ITM and what you guys do. Okay. We work, we're consultants, which, uh, you know, uh, look, you know, sometimes people each use consultants for employed with a briefcase, but uh, we're, we're a little bit more sophisticated than that because this is how we make our living. Um, Essentially, I think uh, one of our literature was were described as dealing with a nutball electronic assembly, and uh, we deal with uh, you know all aspects of uh, uh, the assembly process. We uh, one of our specialty things is uh, process audits, which we've been doing for really over thirty years. We find our technique, and we do it for uh, certainly as a, as a uh, process failure analysis, nice way of saying troubleshooting. Uh, uh, method of operation 
But we also do it. We write in by customers who want to improve the process. We seem to be doing okay, but what could we be doing better? So that's one of our core mark uh, things. We have two patents on our process methodology. Um, we uh, we also do a lot of uh, uh, we call again process failure analysis, uh, which we we as I've always done is troubleshooting. Uh, but uh, basically, a failure analysis lab will tell you, yes, you have and pillow, or, or yes, you have this. We the ones will go out, go out, look at your process, and uh, basically explain why and what you could do about it. Um, so things like that, and of course we do education. We do a lot of conferences, uh, uh, workshops um, yeah, at all the biggies, and also for customers. Sometimes I us in to uh, do workshops and kind of customize it for a particular customer. Anything add to that, Jim? Put on your glasses. Sorry, figured. No, I didn't. The uh, I just want to emphasize training because that's what I I do most. Right. Uh, we offer training uh, in. Basic technology of assembly and also best practices of current technologies, new technologies, and we uh, we, we we offer those in public forums. We all always speak at Apex and SMTAI and so forth. But we also bring these in house and tailor them to the specific needs of specific customers or uh, uh, training their in house people for the specific uh, problems and advances and developments that they're working. on. So, Jim, also you're involved, uh, I know both of you helped create the SMT uh, process uh, certification course, um, and Jim, I, I believe you're one of the instructors for that course. Um, I'm explain a to primary me, English language instructor, yes. So explain to me what that course is, uh, what types of people take it, what, what does it do for those who manage to pass it? Well, that's important, passing it. It has a very serious exam of um, essay Problem solving questions, not multiple choice. That's one of the foundations of it. it. It is truly a certification for people who are experienced and want to get, uh, you know, a shingle or a, a placard to say, "Hey, to, to, to show to other people, um, I have, I am knowledgeable in all the basics of the entire process." So it's uh, not just a. I a reflow process or a printing process well, or a soldering uh, materials, process. It's the whole process. Um, materials, processes, and um, uh, and so forth. The, and I would um, imagine as, as uh, electronics have evolutionized, um, that that course is kind of a living course. It, it must yes. change from time to time to reflect current technology. It, it, do, it does, but we still try to emphasize the basics. We emphasize it's not an advanced technology. You don't have to prove that you know the latest phrase. What you have to prove in the exam, through the exams is that you understand the basics. Uh, our philosophy is that there's always new problems. You know, Tomorrow there's going to be another new one. Uh, but the bigger and the, and the more comprehensive your foundation is, um, then the better you are prepared to deal with the, the new thing that we don't know about yet. And yeah. so that's the way we, we run it, we go through the whole process, starting from very basics. We take a, a day and two thirds to go to review the entire process from uh, materials. We do a basic unit on soldering. Um, one of the best parts of it, I think, Mike, is stencil printing. Now, we all know that stencil printing is one of the most important processes because it generates at least 50%, probably more like 70 or 80% of all the defects we encounter. Now, if you think about it, it's three things. It's a printing machine, a stencil, and solder paste. Three different things you buy typically from three different vendors, and you've got to make them work together. So what we've done is, um, and so you typically get information, get information from the solder paste people, information from the printing sheet people. Um, and they, of course, have their own slant on it, the way they present the material. Mm -hmm. What we've done is unpackage that, all that material, and present it in what we think is the most logical way of, of to, to get the best overall view of the process and the many interactions that control the ultimate quality you get out of it. Yeah, it, it's, it sounds like quite a valuable course, uh, probably good for one's career as well. I mean, talk about a shingle, right? You know, it's um, something and, that will work on your permanent record. That's right. I, um, I just did a SMTA update. Every month, um, I do an update on events that are coming up. And of course, this month, by the time our audience sees this, this will, this will already have happened. 
but I know there's a um, there's a certification course coming up in Mexico um, in the next uh, week or, or two. That, and that will be in Spanish, um, taught by our Spanish language instructor um, Ian Castellanos, um, who is uh, um, works for India, and he does our um, Spanish language uh, courses. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and there's three or four as I recall, of these courses spread around the country. Um, and in order to uh, take this course, uh, the course is offered, although you are one of the instructors and the two of you are two of the uh, contributors to the course, um, it actually is offered by SMTA. So if someone is interested in taking this course, um, you can go to smta.org, as I'd mentioned in the intro, and get more information on that. Um, I had mentioned that I just did the update, and part of that update was explaining a little bit about the course. It, it seems to be a, a two-day course, a half day, three day. of instruct three day. Okay, so um, one full day of instruct, a day and a half of instruction, and a day and a half day of testing. Day third, of the, thereabouts. The first day is all instruction. Review. I like to say it's a review. It's a review of what the people should know. I mean, theoretically, an experienced process engineer should be able to come in and take the exam, mm -hmm. but uh, the reality is, you know, few of us, there are, haven't been many comprehensive basic training programs for SMTA, for, for electric, electric assembly. So you learn the way you learn your word processor, right? You learn what you need to know to do the, the problem, solve the problem today. So it, many people, although they've been in the industry, there are gaps. You know, they haven't worked a lot with tests or they haven't worked a lot with uh, dispensing or things like that. So I think for most people who come to the course, it's, it's an opportunity to fill in the gaps in their experience. And so, again, it's not advanced, but to learn the basics of all of the uh, steps in the step. And speaking of basics, uh, polish up your algebra, because uh, from what I understand, yes. there's quite a bit of algebra <laughs> involved. You have to not just come up with the answer. You have to show your work in some cases. Is that That's correct? Correct. That's yeah, correct. Yeah. Which it, it's also wow. we want to note that uh, from the from its original inception, it's not multiple choice, and right. uh, you know as a lot of other courses or you have to know it, and um, is it, it and it's based on as uh, our co-author of it, Dr. Ron says, you're on a manufacturing floor, you have a problem. God doesn't send out a billboard and say choose A, B, C, or D. You better know what you're talking about. Right. So. And by the only way, time you get a multiple list from God is the Ten Commandments. After, yeah, sorry, and none um, of those are optional, right? That's ten course, out of ten. A little course in that too. The Ten Commandments of Electronic Assembly. Right. But, uh, well, even someone who, I, even someone who right. doesn't is not familiar in, with electronics. If you had multiple choice, they're going to have a twenty twenty five percent chance of getting. Yeah. Well, right, yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, Jim. And I got like to finish no. up the uh, the uh, the three day sequence. First day and two thirds are this review. On the end of the second day, we take two hours for a closed book exam, which are simple, short answer questions, maybe a simple calculation. The entire third day, well, we do a, a review of anything the students want to ask. And then very early, we start and we give the students about seven hours to complete the closed book exam, which is five large problems that they have to analyze and solve. Uh, most people take about four or five hours to complete that part of the exam. So that's the, that's the three days. Yeah. Well, again, more information on the SMT process um, right. uh, certification is available at smta.org. Um, right. By the way, Mike, Jim will be, yeah. uh, Jim will be uh, giving the course at uh, SMTAI in October. And uh, so, I mean, this is a great opportunity. You know, um, the guy, one of the co-authors of the course, it's like kind of like going to a concert. Instead of somebody covering a song, you got the original artist. So you have the Bob Dylan of the, well, that's probably a bad analogy. Jim's still pretty coherent, but you, you get the idea. You get, get the original here and you'll want to go after test. Very good. Um, what would you, what would you guys consider to be the perpetual problems? The problems that just won't die, that just won't go away. The, you know, on, on this show, we spent the first two years of the show largely talking about voiding. And 
you know, there were two trains of thought. We can get into this part later, but, you know, those that say voiding is a big issue, we need to solve it, we need to, you know, strive toward, you know, zero zero percent voiding, and then there are those on the other end of the coin that are just like, voiding's way overrated, it's not a big deal, you don't need even 70 percent coverage, you know, you could have 30, 40 percent voiding, everything's fine. Um, so we, we've heard both opinions on the show, but that's just an example of a perpetual problem. What are some of the other perpetual problems that you see in your business um, that cause Wave your phones soldering. to ring? Wave soldering. Yeah, there you go. It's forever. Everybody wants it to go away. Everybody wants through whole components to go away, but they don't. And uh, as Phil can probably explain it better, it doesn't get a lot of press and a lot of emphasis, but it's still there. You got those few through hole components, you got to solder. And, um, you know, for large volume, you like to use wave solder. But because there isn't a lot of training, the experts are retiring. And so you get a lot of new people who have it at a big experience because it isn't given a lot of uh, press. And so we get a lot of questions on board talk. A very high percentage of our questions are on uh, wave solder as one technology. Yeah. yeah, I would think more and more, I, I would think that would be a more popular question today than wow. 20 years ago or 30 years ago, uh, because wave yeah, because soldering exactly. went from- doing it as much more in-house expertise uh, 20 right. years ago, because it was such right. a bigger part of your tonal assembly process. But now it's a small part, but it's still critical like any other part. So, yep. um, and yet you don't have this, this expertise is slowly retiring. Right, the early days of surface mount, I recall, um, people were gluing them to the bottom side of a board and running them through right. a wave solder machine. Yeah. But the yeah. early days of surface mount, as I've said on the show before, were basically through hole components with the leads just, you know, bent 90 degrees outward, right? They they were not the surface mount we know today. Certainly bottom terminated components cannot be glued to the bottom of a board and run through a wave solder machine. There's nothing to solder, right? Well, in fact, any multi-leaded component is very, very difficult because of the bridging problems. Right. Um, they like a, a, a QFP with 208 going leads around there at even 50 mil pitch, yeah. the older way in the day, were still very difficult to wave siren without having massive bridging. I started my career in this industry in 1985, working for a startup company with a novel soldering machine. It, it, was, it was not new technology, but it was a novel approach to this new technology. It was called drag soldering. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Sometimes sure. referred to as dip soldering. Yep. And it was supposed to be the best thing since sliced bread for through hole. Yep. And it was really good for through hole. And because yep. and, it could take long leads, you didn't have to cut your leads short. It had a, you know, a three inch depth solder pot. So you could have leads hanging out as far as you want. Um, they put technology in that would, that would you know, prevent yep. bridging. And it, it was pretty good. The yep. um, problem that I had was I entered the um, industry um, at the very beginning of surface mount, at the very beginning of the obsolescence of this new technology. <laughs> so, you know, I was, I was like the guy that came up with the latest design of the horseshoe right around the time Henry Ford came up with a Model T. Uh, it was just bad timing. Um, but uh, I would think 30 years ago, most boards were soldered in a wave solder machine. So that was the yep. you know, conventional technology and surface mount was new. Everyone was trying to figure out how to, how to uh, do surface mount. Now we ha kind of have the opposite problem. Uh, almost everyone is experienced with surface mount and fewer are experienced with through hole. Exactly. So it's just exactly. a problem right. turned on its head, right? But the, but the problem, the, Mike, mm -hmm. the problem ahead, we're seeing, uh, with, with uh, as Jim is explaining, with uh, uh, understanding, comprehending through hole technology, yeah, we've had improvement in equipment, we started selective soldering, but again, you have a lot. We have to be big of intrusive soldering, pin and paste, uh, but but what, what Jim's saying, uh, the, the this evaporation, the tribal knowledge is uh, symptomatic of, I would say, probably one of the biggest problems we have in our industry. And the corresponding to that, where do we get good talent? That is the biggest problem. That's a problem we hear wherever we go, whether it's a CE app, an OEM, um, it, whatever country we go to. Where do you get new talent? Where do you get people to operate? Not, not just as engineers, and thank God for STEM, but we need more engineers. And uh, the technician at the technician level, I mean, a number of times I'd recommend, why don't you guys set up a kiosk in the student union, the local community college, and grab them as you can. But this is this is probably one of the biggest problems. You know, as, as us guys with tin whiskers are slowly uh, fading away, 
uh, you know, who's, who's, who's going to run your process. So it, yeah. it, it, I, I have to say that's the biggest problem. We hear it everywhere we go. Yeah, phenomenon often referred to as the silver tsunami, right, or the grain <laughs> out of our industry. And, and that is a real problem. We've talked about it on the show before. Um, subject matter experts that work in companies uh, are retiring, and they're not being replaced by single subject matter experts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've talked to Doug Pauls on this subject, and, you know, obviously he's working with a protege, uh, Doug Pauls from uh, Rock, uh, from uh, Collins right. Aerospace, formerly Rockwell. Um, you know, he's the cleaning conformal coating expert for the entire company. And when he goes, as much as he can train the, the new person, when he goes, a lot of the process knowledge, a lot of the knowledge of where all the skeletons, process skeletons are buried, mm -hmm. go with them. And, um, and a, a lot of companies now are not embracing, I'm not saying Collins is, I'm sure they are, but, but other companies are not really embracing having one person whose total job is to know one thing very well, right? Oh. Uh, and unfortunately, and fortunately, that causes two uh, reactions. One, the unfortunate one, is who, who do process engineers go to or, or you know, technicians yeah. go to for advice? They go to vendors. V you know, yeah. uh, as Maslow said, you know, if all you have is a hammer, all you see is a bed of nails, right? And, and if you talk to a cleaning person, for example, every problem can be solved by cleaning. If you talk to you know, a thermal uh, management company, a uh, profiling company, every problem is gonna be a better profiler, right? Every solution to a problem is gonna be a better profiler. Right. So you're kind of having you know, a fox in the hen house scenario. On the good side is it, it could drive more uh, younger engineers uh, to conferences to hear the experts speak, it could cause younger engineers and others to go to consultants like yourself and others um, to, to seek advice before you guys join the silver tsunami and, and leave. <laughs> it's good well, for the show. This podcast was done for this reason, just to memorialize all the best practice information before you all retire, you know? To that point, Mike, all three of us are participating in uh, organizational things to produce um, sustainable training programs, passing on some of this knowledge, both of um, too many, but uh, I know we all work through the SMTA and their uh, training programs, their one-on-one -on -one program. In fact, Mike, you created the first 201 program in the um, uh, uh, SMTA training uh, program. Uh, program. Uh, yeah, yeah, the first 201 training course. And, and the reason but, why is because all problems can be solved by cleaning, Jim. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, and I'm, I'm in the process like. of doing one with um, uh, Chris Shea and Ron Lasky on uh, how to do a design of experiments. And of course, everything can be solved with a design of experiments, you know, the same it's thing. Right. Uh, also, um, Bill and I are working with the um, IPC to create a training course on um, uh, troubleshooting. Again, that will be sustainable, that will go beyond us. Yeah, um, all that is a is a reaction to the current situation, yep. which is yep. the aging out of our right. workforce, the um, slow, too slow emergence of new engineers stepping up. And when someone graduates a university, you know they have a good understanding of how electrons work. They have a good understanding of 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 um, electrical circuits. They don't probably unless the university has a really good working lab and they spend a lot of time in it, uh, they probably don't have a good understanding of proper squeegee pressure or the difference between an MPM printer and a deck printer or, or whatever, um, or um, certain types of cleaning agents and, and you know, best practices for checking concentrations uh, to keep it in the cleaning world. Um, that's not really taught at a university level. That's way down a rabbit hole. And yeah. that is learned on the production floor. Right. from people who know. And when those people who know leave, that leaves a big void. And that right. unfortunately puts the, the burden uh, on, not so much a burden, but it puts a responsibility on, on the suppliers who look through the world with a very narrow lens, right? So, you know, right. a, a little bit of a, a polarized um, uh, and, and a polarized lens. Uh, that could be good information. It could be partisan information. You know, we just, we just don't know. 
point. What are some of the key factors well, that... I, I just want to yeah, end up the other things, the uh, passing of the guard, so to speak, is, you know, kind of going back to how we got to where we are. You know, it re sometimes repeats itself, but knowing how we got here, for example, uh, the fact that, you know, any any automotive, OEM or CEM, you, you walk into these days, uh, people are using gloves. The gloves, where does that come, come from? Well, you know, I always like to give the end bill about uh, Terry Munson's study when he was at Delphi, the shower effect, and uh, other things. Uh, of course, it, is, it was a rude awakening. We were at, I think we were team teaching at, uh, um, there's some TI or Apex uh, a couple of years ago, and I was citing something, a study that was done by, uh, I think it was done by ATT North Carolina uh, back in the uh, mid 80s on inspection, the uh, uh, visual inspection and the subjectivity of it. And I'm, I'm going, but you guys, you know, boards were a lot easier back then. You guys remember the you know, largest component we had, uh, the smallest component we had was an 0805, you know, they didn't have BTAs yet. Things, like, things were easier. Jim goes, Phil, none of these people in the audience were born in 1985. So, oh, God, man, that was sobering, Jim. I'll tell you, man, what, what did we come to old men in the room? I know, right? It's just right. something. So there is something to the history, as, as you well know. You know the three of us were lucky. To have been involved in electronic assembly at the inception of SMT. So we've seen the whole story. So uh, talk about being in the right place at the right time. But uh, sure. uh, yep, but time marches on. That's true. You, you, you mentioned uh, an example about gloves. I have a theory on gloves. And yeah. I think given the choice of how gloves are currently used today, I would prefer people not wear gloves to wearing gloves the way they're wearing gloves today. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, if I'm picking up a board uh, just to inspect it and I don't have any gloves nearby, I am holding it by its edges. I am not touching the face of the board. You know, I'm a contamination expert, right? So I, I know what happens. But, but I'm really, really careful about how I handle that board. Um, if I'm wearing gloves, I'll manhandle that board, no problem. I can't tell you how many times I see people take their gloves off put them in their dirty smock pockets, mm -hmm. go to lunch, come back, put the gloves back on. Hands get washed several times a day for most people. Um, gloves never get washed. Gloves are supposed to be disposable. Every time you take them off, they should never be put back on. But I can't well, tell you how many times I've seen people reuse gloves over and yeah. over and over and over again. And um, you know, you, you may not transfer skin oils by doing that, but you will transfer everything else those gloves have touched. Um, so, you know, my my personal preference is unless there's a, you know, the, there's an attitude of and a practice of throwing out gloves every hour or whatever, every time you take them off, never reuse them. Um, I'd rather see people hold them more carefully with their bare hands yeah. than, right. than, you know, sloppily with dirty gloves. Pursue it to that, Mike. Anything else that touches the board, like fixtures, test probes, and everything else, also can potentially become sources of cross contamination. Yeah, I uh, an anecdote for that. The first year, SMTA back then, SMTA and IPC produced the high reliability cleaning and conformal coating uh, forum, um, which, by the way, is coming up in uh, next week. By the time everyone watches or hears this, it's already <laughs> happened. Um, now it's an SMTA event uh, uh, ex exclusively. Uh, but um, the first time they had it in Chicago several years ago, someone from Research in Motion, um, otherwise known as BlackBerry. Remember BlackBerry? All the young kids are like, what's a BlackBerry? Um, they, you know, they made mobile phones, which at the time were as popular, if not more, than the iPhone. Right? It was the phone of choice. Well, they were before the iPhone. They were yep. before the iPhone. The right. iPhone killed them, yes, uh, obviously. Right. But, exactly. but yep. um, they had a uh, an issue where they had to clean. They had to clean, and there are certain people who just don't have to clean. If you're building 10 million, 20 million, 50 million of the same thing every year, you can design out certain you know, the economy of scale. The scale itself is 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 so great that you can spend money to design out a process and save money. You know, uh, the 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 uh, anecdote, I don't know if it's true, was, you know, one year American Airlines took the olives out of the martinis. I remember that, serving you know, first class, yeah. and they saved X amount of dollars a year in fuel, you know, by having to carry the extra weight. American Airlines decided for many years not to paint their planes. 
They right. just put a decal stripe on it, and it was basically shiny aluminum, uh, you know, on the yeah. plane. And they did it because it saved weight and it saved fuel. Um, yeah. And the, in their infinite in generosity, they passed it on to the uh, the, the passengers that consumed it. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And fares, like, fares yeah. plummeted. Um, yeah. But BlackBerry had to start cleaning certain parts of the board. Now, why? They they were a strict no clean, and even today, you know, I think iPhones and all the others are are pretty. I'm pretty confident they're all no clean. Um, but they had a contamination problem, a cross-contamination problem, to your point, uh, Jim. They had silicon mold release that somehow got on a component, and they couldn't oh, solder yeah. to it, right? They couldn't solder to it. You know, if you want to punk a, a friend, um, put a little Vaseline on a solder joint and, and watch the solder just get, you know, repel. But, and they, they discovered that... The, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, they discovered after an investigation that the silicon mold release came off the component reels. You know, when their component reels have to pop out yeah. of a mold, they use mold release, yeah. and there was too much mold release, and it transferred to the component and caused a problem. Um, so they had to rescue clean a whole bunch of components so that they could use them. Uh, and then they, you know, they fixed the problem. But um, it goes to show, to your point, uh, the the common you know, the, um, the 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 ability for anything in your factory to transfer to anything in your factory. It's not just humans. Yeah. Right. What are some of the key factors that influence reliability of circuit assemblies in general? What what do you consider? You you've mentioned already, Jim, um, printing being responsible for twenty or thirty percent of all process issues. I've even heard numbers even higher than that. Uh, but what what other types of of uh, factors influence reliability. Well, if we take real long-term reliability, Mike, you're, you're down to the uh, durability of your solder joints. And, um, I'll, uh, of course, getting the right solder paste and so forth, but a uh, really good, well, docu fully documented reflow profiles, really important. You know, making sure that all the solder joints on an assembly are seeing the proper time temperature. And um, uh, whereas if you don't, if you don't instrument it and use profiling procedures, uh, they pretty much inspect, but you might have a number of solder joints, like particularly um, the, the solder balls under a large PGA component. If you don't actually put a thermal cup under there and measure them, you're not really sure that they absolutely got to proper wedding temperature. They probably, could, they, they probably got close and they um, uh, created an electrical connection, but they didn't get fully processed. So maybe they have voids, maybe they have you know marginal wetting. So the board, the board works, but then long term, they fail before you want them to in real life. So that's um, certainly an important thing. Yep. And Bill, of course, what do you see? People are by cleanliness also, obviously, and uh, you know, Wow, you could do several webinars on uh, on, on clean, podcasts like cleanliness, Mike. But uh, you know, where people are taking a closer, you know, look at you know what is clean, what isn't clean, what's the effect on um, things like conformal coating and uh, you know, eggs reacting, no cleans reacting with the environment, cleaning, no clean. So cleaning, obviously, a lot more attention than you know, say ten years ago. I think in terms of reliability. Yeah, um, Jim, to your point about thermal profiling. Um, our friends and colleagues at Foresight and us uh, produced a DOE a few years ago where we ran um, test coupons. Uh, yeah, I read uh, those results. Two boards. And we purposely ran um, various profiles, and, and we ran the recommended profile, peak reflow temperature uh, profile. And then we lowered the peak reflow temperature yep. below the recommended amount by just 5%. We can vary 5% day to day in a manufacturing process. We lowered it 5%. Um, the boards that were at the pro proper reflow temperature, and they, they were reflowed with um, uh, a no clean uh, solder paste, they passed 168 hour surface insulation resistance tests. So they were considered by IPC standards as very clean. The same boards processed at 5% lower temperatures failed all the SIR tests. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, not just for solderability. I mean, we think about reflow temperature so we get a good solder joint, so we avoid cold solder joints and other uh, failure modes. Uh, it also influences 
uh, the residues that are on a board, you know, particularly mm -hmm. no clean, because no Literally. clean uh, is supposed to be all the all the bad actors are supposed to be burned off, and oh, when yeah. the peak reflow temperature is marginally low, those bad actors are staying on the board, and they're going to do what they do. They're going to create uh, dendritic growth and electric leakage and all sorts of nasty things. Okay, but, Mike, you, we've been having a cleaning perspective. Um, I'm, I'm a reflow guy. The reflow perspective, um, pursuant to what you said, five percent, you should test your reflow oven to find out what its repeatability is. Find out when you run the same board, the same profile, or if you use one of these test things like a, a an oven rider or something like that, you should run it multiple times under different typical process conditions, loaded, unloaded, and so forth. And see how much the peak temperature varies, right? And it does, is it 5%, is it 2%? And then you should include that when you set up the tolerance on your, your uh, specification, on your uh, profile specification to uh, allow for that. Say, okay, I'm going to run this profile because, you know, every time you profile a board, you're not going to run it 20 times to see the repeatability of that profile. You got to know what, what the pro, what the repeatability of your oven is and assume that's going to be similar over most boards and then apply that to your spec and say, Okay, um, you know we're going to get this, but um, we're going to measure on a one-shot profile a certain temperature. But we know in real life that can vary, so we're going to set that in the specification of that temperature to allow for that. So we're still in that um, good range where we won't get these bad results that will affect reliability. Agreed. What but, industry standards do you typically rely on when you're? consulting with a with a customer or doing some kind of investigation or or training a customer are there specific go-to standards that you use to um, compare what the customer is producing versus what they you know what the industry says they should produce well obviously the old standards uh, you know which everybody has is of course uh, uh, IBC 610 and uh, 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 J spec uh, uh, Zero zero one, probably the standards, and then we like to see people in, informed about uh, sixteen oh two, which of course you know, deals with moisture sensitive devices, things along those lines, and then of course there's the specific specs. We're working with EA to the specs that you know uh, correspond to that, and we'd like to see that. But so much of what we have, I think, I think one of the problems is people are always looking for a spec uh, as as the you know, holy scripture. And in reality, so much is, is what is what we call best practices. They're not yet specifications. They might become specifications, but it's what's been found by industry practice to be, you know, the best solution at the time with what we add and what we're dealing with. And uh, that's that's quite frankly, basically what whatever our process audits are all about. Um, sure, we like to see adherence to, you know, specifications. We like to see their handling things properly. If you are wearing gloves, still you have to hold the board by the edge. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, uh, but things like that. But the other is is best practices. So with our audits, uh, what we do is in results we we have what we we have three levels of recommendations. We don't we we don't assign your know, weights like that. I know a lot of people who audit to do that. We just found out it said it still turns out to be subjective. So basically, what we do is we have three levels of recommendations. Level one is do this or die. This is definitely affecting your yields, affecting the reliability of the product. You've got to rectify this. Level two is probably the mainstream one. And yes, you're doing it this way, but industry best practices, you might be doing a lot better, you know, if you do it this way. Yep, it's work, work better if you use best practices. And and so that's really the crux of uh, what we're doing. Um, and by the way, to add to what we discussed before, uh, Jim mentioned reflow, uh, Mike, when cleaning, you know, I have to look back at printing the excited face deposition. And it's still, uh, as Jim said at the outset, you know, when you're anywhere between 50 to 85 percent, now we're walking to places where 90 percent of the defect will come in from printing. So it's, it's, uh, it's still very, there's a lot of operator interaction input, proper DOE must have been done, but we're getting better at it. And I would say, that, uh, you know, one of the things very happy to see is over the last 30 years, the acceptance. Uh, and the, the embrace of SPI, solder-based inspection, automatically. We're seeing more and more of that. Uh, we did a, a survey for uh, marketing analysis many, many years ago, about 30 years ago, 
And we thought like maybe 7% of the, of the industry was actually doing any kind of solid post break inspection. And most of that was, you know, human. And now, Jim, what would you say in terms of SPI, running the range of SPI, maybe 80%, 85%? It's, it's getting there. And the people who yeah. don't have it tell you, oh, yeah, we're getting that next year. Yeah. And just for the very small percentage of my audience who don't know what SPI is, you're talking about solder paste inspection. Right. post yes. inspection. Correct. Uh, yeah. Standalone, and, after print, um, inspecting um, all of the joints, all of the deposits on the board for volume, height, and shape. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to one thing, I highlight one thing about specs that Phil talked about. And that is J standard 033, the one that defines, uh, controls moisture sensitivity and exposure of uh, our um, IC comp, mostly our IC components. Your IC components are mostly a molded bla black plastic, and that's hydroscopic. It, it absorbs moisture from the atmosphere. And if you leave them out of the moisture barrier bags for too long, they can absorb too much moisture. When you go to reflow them, they damage the internal structure of the component. Um, from our all our audits, this is the number one um, number one uh, problem. People who don't have an airtight moisture sensitivity program, so, meaning that uh, according to their rules, there are possible scenarios where their components can be overexposed and they won't know about it. And uh, as we all know, uh, we, we all know about popcorn, you know, with popcorn actually cracks during reflow. That's actually a good thing because you know it happens. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about it enough. You see, it's the, le the lower levels of damage internally, like delamination, cracking the wire bond, that may not get picked up uh, in the assembly facility. The, the, the product may work, may pass tests, but you get out in the field and you get intermittents, things like that. And because we don't fully uh, uh, analyze all failures in the field, we have we don't have any idea of how many what percentage of field failures are created by moisture sensitive damage that got that slip through and got out into the field and worked for a while and then had a problem. So the answer is to follow uh, J standard O thirty three and really control your moisture expenditures. It's clearly laid out time based upon the moisture sensitive level and you have to keep them in the bag or in a, a dry box um, uh, for all the time before they go, go through their final reflow step you know the, the you do a double-sided reflow you got to worry about those components on the first side that now sat around for a while while you were assembling the second side now they go back in the oven uh in addition to the uh J 16 standards. And two on boards you you, you got to handle those boards the same way they're they're basically uh, <laughs> moisture level, well, yeah, MSD three type components. But um, sorry, Mike, didn't mean to interrupt that. No, 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 no. That's um, in addition to the J standards that you were referring to on moisture sensitive devices. The MSD Council, Moisture Sensitive Device Council, is another good resource uh, as well. Um, the proliferation. Let's talk about EVs for a moment. Um, do any of you have an EV or a hybrid? I have a plug-in hybrid. Plug-in hybrid. Um, the, so but this I, doesn't I really a diesel, but don't, don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm an outlier, you know. The good thing about plug-in hybrids is they're really designed to be plugged into a 110 outlet um, because yep. you're not trying to get three or 400 miles of range on a battery, right? right. So, I, get, I get 25 to 30 on one, and it takes five and a half hours. I just plug it in overnight, and right. I get, if I don't drive more than 30 miles, I have an all-electric car. Right. So this doesn't apply to you, but for those who opted for just the plug-in, not the hybrid model, um, you know, they're seeing, uh, with the exception of Tesla, Tesla seems to be doing something right in terms of their charging stations, but the public chargers, the Charge Americas of the world and, and others, um, according to um, published accounts, uh, at any given time, up to 25 to 30 percent of those chargers are, are broken. They're not functional. Uh, yeah, part really. of it is, you know, stupid human tricks. Part of it is vandalism. People drive into them, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, that's not really a design issue. Um, but a lot of it is a, is a design issue. Uh, they're, they're, they're placed in harsh environments, uh, but they're not built to class three standards. And although they should be built to class three standards, not because people die if they fail, like maybe in aviation or medical, um, but 
because they just won't work unless they're built to a higher level of standard to incorporate the um, intended climactic environment, the harsh environment they're going to be operating in. What's your take on the, uh, I'll make it a broad question, on the electrification of cars, the amount of electronics that are now in cars, even even internal combustion engine cars, ICE cars, and uh, the proliferation of IoT, Internet of Things in general, where we're putting electronics into things that formerly never had electronics and, and quite frequently don't need electronics. Uh, we're doing it because we can. Um, no. There, there's a there's a entry into the electronic assembly world from people who were not formally in the electronic assembly world. And uh, what's your take on that? What types of lessons can we learn from that? Uh, what issues do you see, if you see any issues at all in your world? Um, what types of issues do you see with with this new um, th this new uh, business sector of of IoT and, and uh, the EV world. Well, I guess I guess right off the bat, you know, one aspect in IoT that kind of uh, uh, I'm apprehensive about is that uh, we see IoT, whether it's in cars, with or our factories, you know, our assembly lines, we're seeing more and more of it. It's wonderful. Yes, I. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of bad players out there. And uh, I'm just waiting to hear about somebody's assembly line or factory, or, uh, you know, that, that got hacked and are being held for ransom. Hey, it's probably happened already. We should have heard about it. Um, so we're kind of kind of walking in that territory. And the other is, you know, it, 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 with regard to the functionality of the technology, um, it's evolving. It's getting there. It's not there yet. Uh, I heard a story the other day somewhere in the Bay Area where they had these autonomous taxis. Uh, uh, and all of a sudden, they were like, 30 of them, between 30 of them, they just stop. Usually in intersections, causing a lot of, um, lot of aggressive thoughts towards, you know, this this type of thing. They just stop for about, I think it was like about 15, 20 minutes. Then they started up again. You know, they just stand there and their, you know, lights would flash, the horns would beep. So, you know, we're not there. But I, I'm more concerned about our role globally uh, using these things. And, and again, technology for technology's sake, as you said, Mike, you know, so much of that these days. Yeah, we got to do this. We have to do that, and yet there's no, um, you know, really good reason uh, for for doing it. So, uh, well, I guess I'm just an old folk. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a, a good I, segue. In a, in uh, in in about a month, um, I have a guest on the show to discuss uh, IT um, securing your network best practices. Now, that's not normally a subject for electronic manufacturing, but it should and, be because. Yep. In the world of Industry 4.0, every machine is talking to every machine, and That's if, right. if one of the machines has a vulnerability, say they have a software program that's really uh, sloppily put together, and your network has a little bit of a sloppiness built into it from a security standpoint, you know, one machine can be a, a portal into your entire network, <laughs> and you know, you shut down a reflow oven, you shut down the whole line. Right. right. Everything is linear. So any any one of those assembly blocks removed from the process shuts down your whole line. So it's a, it's a major issue. Mike, years ago, I read a, a study that a, a simulation that was run. They simulated a smart electrical grid with street lights and everything else all controlled with IoT. And they set it up on a computer for a simulation. And, um, you know, they thought they had a reasonable simulation. And then they put a virus in one light bulb, in a street light. And it, I think the simulation said in 15 minutes, the entire grid was dead. Wow. Wow, that's, uh, that's a I little scary. Back to the manufacturing part. And the first thing I think with a lot of these IoT devices is, just as you said, you have to really think about how harsh the environment they're going into and how much you're relying on them. Uh, Phil true. did a project with um, uh, um, IoT-controlled... Um, sprinkler uh, controls for a golf yeah. course and um, you know little electronic things they did all they, they measured moisture sensitivity I think and all this good stuff to you know optimize your water in the golf course but they had problems and bad things happen we are just about out of time and I have pages and pages of questions here so we're going to have to do this again uh, but I do have one more question um, 
Troubleshooting Electronic Assembly Tales from the Board Talk Crypt, a book that you published a few years ago now, I believe. Uh, yep. You were kind enough to send me a copy. I, I didn't bring the copy into my studio, so I've, I'll, I'll put <laughs> it up in post. I should um, on this. That's a good book. Yeah. Phil, no, don't uh, you stand on the shelf right behind you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure he's got that's all back there. Yeah, that's all of them right there, right? If, if you want to buy one, he'll take one off yeah. the shelf, put it in a box. Um, how's the book doing? And uh, any, any kind of uh, interesting feedback from that book? Gee, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, people, people, um, people read it. You know, they they find it a good reference. It's a uh, uh, shameless commerce division here. Uh, you know, that, that is basically. As far as we know, it's the only book, and certainly contemporary book, on troubleshooting, on the topic of troubleshooting. And uh, it, it, it has a great cross-reference, you know, index, and uh, it's, it's just a really great reference book. But it's also good when, uh, you know, you're uh, sitting on the loo and, uh, you know, want something to read. And, uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's interesting because it's, it's in our style. And the way it came about was uh, we were doing uh, some board talks uh, a couple of years ago, as you say, two or three years ago. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, we were looking at the episodes, and it turns out we we had been doing it for ten years, and uh, over two hundred episodes. And it's like time flies when you're having a good time. It was absolutely amazing. I, I was just totally surprised. And uh, it, so, since the transcripts existed, uh, we spoke to our publisher Jeff Ferry, and uh, uh, all be all we made a book. And uh, it seems to be. I, I, I think people really like it. And, uh, you know, try it, read it, but find it handy, and it's affordable too. It's a good resource, like I said. So we've heard good feedback, and um, yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's it's coming along. I wouldn't say it hasn't made the New York Times bestseller list yet, but we, we well, hold out. It's an oh, it's it's quite a, a niche market, right? Right. Yeah, it, it's not a murder mystery. Uh, yeah, but, it's a little um, bit more esoteric. Yeah, although. In some ways, it's a murder mystery. Some people do murder their boards. Well, yeah, some people, some people technique. do their circuit boards. Yep. Oh. Yeah, and you guys are kind of like the uh, CSI, crime scene investigators, right? <laughs> Figuring out, uh, you know, who or killed so and so with a or, hammer in the pantry, right? Well, <laughs> Your clue. Um, each of you, as our, this is the last question, um, share with me your funniest either anecdote from the book or from your board talk. Your your audio program that's on Circuit Insight. Um, what's one of the funniest stories that someone presented to you? You you model your board talk show after the um, uh, long running NPR car talk show. Uh, you you have a very similar style um, where you you make a lot of jokes and you know you have fun with the question and and ultimately you provide sage answers in a in a unique comical way that only you two can do. Um, but what, what's some of the funniest stories that, that each of you share? One funny story uh, or, or very interesting story from your board talk experience. Well, I, I'll go first. Um, oh, really? We had one that basically said, what do you think about putting weights on your um, um, BGA component when they go through the repo of it? And what was happening is they were getting opened, I assume, due to warpage and so forth. And their solution is we'll take a heavy piece of metal and put it on top of the compound to hold it down while it's going through the reflow of it. And your question is, well, did you do, did you profile the board with that weed on it? And what other, you know, that's a band, that's a classic Band-Aid solution, right? What What is causing the problem? What's the root cause? Is it uh, compound is warping? Your profile is not shaped correctly. It's causing warpage. Um, you got a solder paste issue or something like that. But, uh, you know, putting you can imagine somebody after the placement machine sitting there with these little weights, putting them on top of key <laughs> compost before it goes into the oven. I thought that was a pretty funny situation. Classic. And Phil? I guess the one that sticks in my mind the most was somebody asked us uh, uh, if it was okay to use Windex to clean their circuit boards. And uh, yeah, all the sophisticated you know, work and everything on cleaning and chemistries, it's the way that Windex. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I personally use Mr. Clean, but you know, it's like, a, but it, 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 it's the same thing. I put that in the same category, though, when they have about it, as people use paper slicers for uh, singulating the boards. And, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I always go to Walmart for my circuit board assembly equipment. So uh, that's one that sticks in my mind the most. And that reminds me of the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. One of the characters in the movie, um, you know, the main character's father uh, was. 
his solution to everything is put Windex on it, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it and in the movie it always worked. So, um, so I guess that's the difference between art and life. My favorite was not I didn't have this experience personally, but one time, you know, when you go to trade shows and conferences, you tend to, you know, go to a bar yeah. afterwards and you, you, you tell yeah. your, you know, Fox Hall stories to everybody, you know, life on the road. And I was talking to someone who sold a semi automatic stencil printer. Yeah. And you know it was it was a pneumatic machine um, that that ran the, the squeegee blade, um, no electricity, 100% pneumatic. Like, uh, and they got a call from a customer that the machine was leaking, and he said, "Leaking, leaking, leaking what?" He goes, "Water, yeah. water everywhere." He says, well, "I don't understand." Hey. Well, obviously you can figure that out. The customer connected a water line to the yeah. air line, yeah. and huh. every time you you know, and of course air escapes right they have these little escape vents for the air you know uh, well, I know. They, so every time you would normally run it with air and you hear that little tsh, that ended up being a, a spray event <laughs> of water uh, and the customer was trying to figure out why it was leaking it was leaking all over the place and the word was the bad on hydraulic yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's when you have to pause and and <laughs> figure out a way to tell the customer without making them feel Stupid, you know. That's outstanding. There's really no way to do it. Just got to rip Look. the Band-Aid off. Yeah. Well, uh, Phil, uh, Zaro, Jim Hall, once again, it's been great to talk to you. We could do this all day. Um, <laughs> my audience is probably going, please don't, but but Not I could do this all day. Um, I, I really um, enjoy talking to you guys, and um, let's do it again. Absolutely, Mike. We'll look forward we'll look to it. Sooner the better. Never and know. to my audience, if you need to get a hold of, of these these uh, uh, fellas, uh, they do have a lot of experience. Uh, they do a lot of work, a lot of really good work between the process certification course at SMTA and their consulting at ITM and other antics they get up to. Um, I will put their contact information in our show notes. So if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast app, uh, just go back to the podcast app, look at the show notes, and you'll see contact information uh, for Phil and Jim. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, click down here somewhere. There's a button that says show more. Click that and you will see the show notes. And while you're on YouTube, if you're on the YouTube channel, don't forget to click the like, subscribe, and bell icon so you can be notified when new episodes are released. If you're listening to this in the car, on the treadmill, or wherever on your podcast app, be sure and subscribe to the show so you'll automatically receive new episodes. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Phil Zaro, Jim Hall, thanks again for being my guest today on the Good Reliability life. Matters podcast. Mike, Great to see Mike, you. one bit of party technical advice. Yes. I know you're going to do this. I know you're going to do this. Like my brother. Point the yeah. other way, Jim. Yeah. I point the other way. There you go. And Phil, you point the other way. I know, I know. He's over here somewhere. Where are there you? we go like Mike either yeah so basically don't solder like any of these guys that's right yeah because if you do Mike. you're going to hire these guys yeah <laughs> you know it's all right. right good seeing it's you guys that's it and Mike we really appreciate you Mike thank you thank you you're welcome thank you well that's another episode thank you for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Or if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, be sure to click the like, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Once again, a special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm for syndicating this show. Thanks again for being part of our podcast family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. And I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.